Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Hack the Hood and Pipelines collab event with the Ravian Prince and Dr. Lauren Cleely Thomas. We are so honored to be here today. Um, before we kick things off, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, who I am and why we're doing this. And so my name is Shari. I'm Director of Operations for Pipelines. We will drop this information in the chat but it's definitely an app that you wanna take advantage of because Pipeline's premise is helping underrepresented talent connect directly to job and training opportunities in tech, entertainment, and creative industries. So if these industries are of interest to you, download the app today in Google Play and App Store. The information's in the chat, check it out. And then once the panelists introduce themselves, Lauren will tell you a little bit more about Hack the Hood. Okay, so we are so excited for this conversation. We really wanted to come together to provide a space to talk about what it means to be uh, BIPOC or Black in tech. Um, black in tech is something that we don't have a lot of conversation about. And as you know, there are major disparities when it comes to Black people connecting directly to opportunities in tech. And so the reason why I pinged Arabian and Lauren is because they have great insight and perspectives to this space. And hopefully you leave inspired, empowered um, to stay the course and let your voice be heard in this, in this wonderful, wonderful industry. So what, before we jump into the conversation, I would love to have the panelists introduce themselves, who they are, what they do, and why they love the tech industry. So let's start with Lauren, Dr. Lauren Quigley Thomas. Let's start with you. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Lauren. I um, am a technical curriculum and training consultant with Hack the Hood. Um, our goal at Hack the Hood really is to help young people have access to tech careers um, with a tra through training. So um, this year we're focusing and shifting our direction, really deepening our commitment to young people in the tech industry by focusing on data science education. So I'll talk a bit about data throughout our conversation today. Um, data is really what builds what we build a lot of our solutions off of in the tech industry. So we're going to talk about that um, a little bit about me. So my background is like all sent all STEM all the time. Basically, um, I did my PhD in engineering education, first black woman to graduate from my PhD program um, in 2013. So it's not uh, that long ago, I guess you could say. Um, my my career has been all over STEM education. I really uh, have focused on large scale programs and in industry. Um, I currently work in the tech industry. I've been in tech for about the last five years. Um, higher ed, all over, really in all industries, thinking about ways that we can, one, expand access so that more people can choose engineering and science and technology as a career. And then also um, really reinventing the ways that we think about uh, technology. So STEM as social justice is really my passion area. So how can we use technology and engineering and math for liberation? So it's a little bit about me. Happy to be here. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lauren. Arabian. Hi. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I am Arabian Prince. Um, we'll get into why I'm called that later. I'm one of the founding members of the rap group NWA, believe it or not, um, but also have been into technology and gaming and music and entertaining for probably about 40 years and um, started out as a poor little kid in Compton just with a dream and a passion for music and video games and has have turned that into a career and a bunch of companies and startups and things like that and um you know my goal in life is to really really go back into the inner cities and show all of the inner city kids and people in general in inner cities that doing this is easy and not hard and anybody can you know make a career out of technology or actually make a career out of anything you put your mind to. I love it, yes. Um, so before we jump into the conversation, I do wanna uh, just remind you guys to please keep your 
um, your videos on mute, not your videos on mute, but your audio on mute, because we want to be respectful of our panelists and what they have to say, and we don't want any distractions. And then also at the end, this is an intimate conversation, so we're just going to roll with it and let it flow. So at the end, um, if you will open the floor for Q&A, if your heart leads you to ask them the questions and come on video to ask them, I want to give you that opportunity. But if you're a little shy and you want me to ask it for you, um, I'll have you DM your question to me personally, to Shari Holly, and I'll ask it for you. So we'll do that at the end so please save your questions for Lauren and Arabian uh, for the end of the conversation so we, whenever I start a panel I just like to start with the origin story because I think our stories and our why is so important right so if you actually could just talk about how, your origin story like what inspired you to pursue the tech industry um, specifically and what was your first start or your first job or experience in tech ladies always first <laughs> Um, so for me, it's kind of corny. I wanted to build robots when I was a kid. Like you, I would watch like cartoons or whatever I'm watching on television. And I, you know, you would see all these robots and I really wanted to make robots. And I thought that you could pretty easily. Um, and my dad was a technician. So he did, um, he worked for a company where basically he was servicing, uh, mailing meters. So like a little thing that you put on to get the printed stamp on your envelopes or whatever. But he had all of these computers around the house and, you know, floppy disks and printed circuit boards and all this stuff. And I was like, this is cool. I'm going to build a robot out of it. I was just over there, like, you know, kind of screwing things together, trying to staple stuff or whatever. I thought I was making a robot. But, um, you know, like having some of those like pieces around was inspiring for me. And then my parents were always just like, you can be whatever you want to be. The world is yours. And you can, you really have this opportunity to, to, you know, grow up to be anything. And it took me a while to get to technology and engineering because I kind of like meandered around. I wanted to be a scientist, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a chemist, all this other stuff. But um, for me, like, I've really found what I was excited about when I started doing research. Um, and I had this opportunity to do research uh, when I was an undergrad, I went to Spelman College. I'm a big HBCU supporter. Um, and I had this opportunity to work in the lab and the idea of building these robots, I was doing it. You know, I'm putting together circuits, I'm putting together, you know, the, the parts and the components. And, and that for me was really like the biggest thing is that when I had the chance to get my hands on to something and then it just kind of grew from there, so. Yeah, and for me, I was, you know, like this young kid growing up in Compton and had an overprotective moms who didn't want me out in the streets with my crazy uncles and cousins doing dirt. So she put me in Catholic school. And for everybody here, um, if you tell anybody my real name, I will find you, I will find you, I will find you. So uh, my real first name is Kim, K-I-M. So imagine being this little kid growing up in Compton with the name Kim, wearing Catholic school clothes, walking home every day. That wasn't a good thing to happen. But anyway, you know, I made it through that. And my uncles and cousins, who were the guys who were the crazy ones in the hood doing all of the bad stuff, didn't want me doing bad things either. So they would give me stuff to do. So they would, here, let me play with their stereo. They would One of my um, cousins was really into music, and he had a ton of vinyl records. It's this black thing with a hole in the middle that you DJs use it for you young kids who don't know what that is. But anyway, um, he would let me play with his vinyl records and his stuff like that. And then he had got a synthesizer and this particular synthesizer music keyboard had two parts. It had the keyboard part and it had this great big, aha, I just thought about something. I have buttons. See, when you get into technology like me, I go crazy sometimes. I'm like Willy Wonka. But when you get into technology like me, you could do stuff like this. It had this thing right here. Yeah, that's it. That was a synthesizer. And imagine being a little kid, like seven, eight years old, and your uncle says, here, play with this. And I used to play with that thing. I could never get sounds out of it until he actually showed me. But that was, you know, one of the things that kind of got my mind going into getting into electronics and eventually getting into technology. And when I was about 14 or 15, my father had a talk radio show on a radio station called K-Ace. And I would sit in the control room 
opposite him and just play with the records and I learned how to mix and become a DJ. So long story short, I became a DJ. I started DJing and from there got into music production. And back in the eighties doing music production, you had to know computers in order to do sequencing and you know other stuff like that because there was no internet, there was no technology like it is today. So I got into computers and um, from there, the rest was history. I you know, fell in love with animation, fell in love with gaming and started working with a lot of big companies doing that. I love the perspective and the insight, I think, because it's all so important, right? And um, I love just the value that you're bringing to the conversation already with your origin story. So to that point, um, I don't know how many of our attendees know this, but I saw this uh, statistic that said approximately 76% uh, of the tech workforce is white and male. That's a large stat, a really disgusting one, a shocking one to some. Um, but when we start to think about that 76% of the tech workforce out of 2020 are white and male. Why do you, where do you think the disconnect is happening? Why aren't there more black people showing up in tech career pathways or the pipeline? And where do you think the disconnect is happening and what needs to happen to change that? That's gonna let Arabian go. <laughs> oh, you want me to go? I'll go, okay. Yeah, I'll go. So what I think on that one is, you know, it's really simple is, it's about having the opportunity, one, knowing these things exist, too. So, you know, like if you go to a magnet school or a school in the suburbs, you know what I mean? They're teaching these kids robotics. They're teach, teaching these kids a lot of higher technical skills that you that you don't get in the inner city. In the inner city, most of the schools, and I'm not, you know, bashing the schools, not all, a lot of them are starting to pick this up as well. They're just trying to push the kids through. And unless a kid has an interest in something, they're not going to want to do it or not, or the family or the parents won't even know anything about it. So I think that's one of the main reasons. And two, and this goes to all kids, is most people and most parents tell their kids that it's hard. Oh, no, you don't want to do that. That's, ooh, that's hard, you know. And, and it's because the parents don't know how easy it is, especially in this newer technology where every kid has a computer in their pocket, you know, and can go on YouTube and learn how to do anything. So I think that those are some of the main reasons. And then there's, there's a racial divide as well and hiring and, and things like that. And those are the kind of things that we have to change. Yeah, I think I'll extend it too. And like, it's not for lack of knowledge or talent. Like there are a lot of, a lot of us that are out here, you know, creating technology and using technology that, you know, maybe we're not working at Apple or maybe we're not working at these places. So it's not for lack of talent. I think, um, you know, part of it is definitely lack of the tech industry trying um, or even being open to the idea of, of hiring and recruiting us. There's lots of controversy, controversy out there that, you know, we're seeing right now about, you know, oh, there's a large percentage of, you know, Black and Latinx and Indigenous youth that really are interested in this area. It's not, we consume technology at a slightly higher rate than other groups as well. So it's not for a lack of interest in the technology. It's lack of access, it's lack of opportunity. Um, and I think that one of the, you know, one of the deeper things that we have to think about too is power because there's so much money to be made in the technology industry. Like, you know, who has the power and who has the capital really makes it a big difference. So it's not for, but like, it's definitely not for a lack of talent and it's not for a lack of interest because those are things that we, we have innate. I think a lot of times too, especially for black folks and Latinx folks, people of color in general, like we have to learn how to make a way like a lot of, like I had a teacher in college and he used to call, you know, kind of putting stuff together and making it work. He called it Afro-engineering. Not exactly the most politically correct thing to say, but it's accurate. Like we know how to make something happen and how to make things happen almost out of nothing. So it's not for lack of talent or skills or problem solving ability. It's, you know, kind of, a, I, I believe a very intentional um, exclusion from the industry. 
Absolutely. And, um, I, and that's a whole reason a major mission of pipelines too, is how do we break that access and opportunity barrier? And so, you know, I love the fact that you said, Lauren, you said we have to almost like make a way, right? And if you listen to both of their origin stories, um, I want to point out the word that they were proactive. There's a certain level of proactivity that has to come, you know, with Black people as we're pursuing tech as well. So when we talk, when we talk about making a way or being proactive, if they're listening today, and let's say they're in a school that doesn't have tech resources or doesn't have a tech program, or then maybe they don't know about the many programs like Hack the Hood or you know Innovate Next that that are doing the good work in this space. How what could they realistically be doing right now to plug in and, and hone their skills and learn more about tech career paths? Because it's really difficult if you don't know where to start. You know, if you didn't have anyone open your eyes to this wonderful industry, like where do you even begin? Like what are some resources they could they could tap into right now? I, I think this is one of the resources right here. That's what we're doing. And we've got to keep, you know, yelling from the top of the mountains to get people to know that we're here and other companies and other resources are here. I'm like the plague. Like I get into these big companies and I'm like, look, why aren't you doing this? Why make them feel bad? You know, you got to do that. You got to make them feel bad. You got to get them to understand that, like, there's no difference between that kid over there and this kid over here, except this kid over here doesn't have the opportunity because of we know why. But, you know, like, we got to change that and get the message out. And, and that's why I, I kind of like, I do it through gaming. I do it through um, social media. I do it through music and entertainment because that's what a lot of kids in the inner cities are interested in. I do it through sports and I often say like, yes, you may not be Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, or LeBron James. And that's, you know, you love basketball, but you'll never make the NBA oh, maybe you can make the NBA because there's so many jobs in the NBA in technology and other avenues. So we got to just kind of, you know, get the knowledge out there of that there are so many careers that they don't talk about in schools or, you know, your parents don't talk about. Yeah, I did all that. But like, you know, you have the power to access like right in your phone you know, there's a lot of information on YouTube, you can definitely, um, I recommend like finding the networks, like, you know, whether it's like, you know, I know I'm old, I use Facebook, but like Facebook groups, um, <laughs> you know, they're finding the people on Instagram that are talking about tech and STEM, like seeing what they're doing, especially like in this time, like, you know, especially with COVID, you can take lots of free courses online to get started. So even if like your school doesn't have something, you can get on Coursera for free and, you know, take some classes to, to develop your own skills. But like, you know, like Shari would say, you have to do something like that agency piece is so important. Um, and then also like, you know, finding people in the, you know, that are interested in the same thing. Like it's always a lot easier to do it with other people too. So finding people, yeah, somebody said in the chat Clubhouse, like there are so many amazing conversations in Clubhouse um, around technology, um, you know, and sometimes it's really interesting. Like, you know, I was in one conversation, they're talking about developing smart cities and they're like, oh, well, you know, we only want to put certain resources in these areas, like in LA or whatever. And it's like, well, wait a minute, like none of y'all are from where we're from. Like, I'm from Patterson, New Jersey. So you know, very similar uh, kind of area. And, you know, we, we want technology too. We want technology that's good for us, that's safe for us. And we can learn, not only can we learn about it, but we can create the solutions that matter um, and are safe for our community. So there's lots of places just like get out there and start reading, like, you know, watching videos, following people, all of that stuff. Cause you can get a lot of information that way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, just as a perfect segue, um, I think another thing that's not really talked about is tech entrepreneurship. You know, we, you don't have to work for a large tech corporation nine to five minute through Friday, but there just aren't enough programs and resources that really inspire our next generation to start their own ideas, like start their own thing. And so um, I want to talk a bit about that. Like if there's somebody out there who, cause I, I think, you know, talent because of the lack of education tend to be very, you know, tunnel vision, like I have to work for these big corporations, it's going to be nine to five, and maybe I don't fit there, or maybe I do. So when we talk, when we talk about innovating, like starting our own businesses, making, creating the path, 
Um, what, like Arabian, I know you, you have your hand in a few different buckets. Like what, what inspires you to go to the non-traditional route? Like I'm just going to create my own path and do my own thing. And how is that working out? What are the benefits and the challenges to being a tech entrepreneur? Yeah. I mean, for me, it started, like I said, when I was young, you know, I became a DJ. And the reason I became a DJ is because I was the only child. My mom's was overprotective and she wouldn't let me go to the parties. So I'm like, well, she won't let me go to the parties. Hmm. If I'm a DJ, I get paid to go to the parties. I'm the first one there and the last one to leave. My mother can take me and no one will laugh. So I figured that one out. And then once I started making money doing that, I'm like, wait a minute, this is kind of cool. So I've technically got my own business at like 15, 16 years old doing DJ sets and making money. And then from that, you know, I got into making records. And that was another business. Some people don't even think about it, but you know, you got the music business. People think about the music, but not the business side of things. So I, I became like this business person at a very young age. And when I got into video games and animation, it was the same way. Um, they wouldn't let me in because I remember um, how I got my first, I would say, gig or job. You know, I've never really had a technical job. But when I first started working on the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, I was just doing animation as a hobby. And because there was no internet and, you know, to the point that was made a little earlier that the kids today have the internet, they have, you know, YouTube, they have Google, they have all these resources to go out and research what they want to do. I really didn't have that. So I had to go out myself and go to conventions and I would go to these conventions and watch people do, you know, animation and look at the hardware and the software involved with it and artists and things like that and fell in love with it and I got really good at it and I literally got discovered by Saban who makes Power Rangers just messing around at a booth showing somebody what I can do on the computer and they were like who are you you're pretty good when I told them like what next thing I know I'm working on the Power Rangers and then from that I wanted to get into video games so I literally contacted Fox who had an interactive division and they didn't want to let me in there either because they said I didn't know anything about video games. And I said, well, you don't either because it's so new. And I ended up going there working part time as a game tester just to understand what they were doing. And then when I figured it out, I started my own company. So I think us, we can be our own entrepreneurs and our own you know, business owners and our own companies. And I do that every single day now. I come up with a concept. I come up with an idea. I do the research. And then I started, I just started my own PC company. I have my own streaming PC company that's going viral right now. And, you know, kids out there, if you have an idea and you don't know how to scale it, you know, ask somebody, you guys know us now, but if not, just do your research on, on, you know, the internet and on YouTube and on Google and find out if there's something out there like it. And if it's not just push and push until you can get somebody to listen to you, to help you create it and bring it to market. Yeah, there's tons of like open source materials too. Like anyone can make an app and put it on the app store. And there's tons of open source material to build your own app. Like, so, you know, take advantage of, especially like, you know, now a lot of things are either open source or democratized. So democratize that anybody can get on GitHub and download the code and do what they need to do. Anybody can, you know, access a lot of these platforms to create your own thing. So, you know, definitely take advantage of that. And it's it's so needed. I mean, if, remember, 76% of the tech industry is white and male. And so it desperately needs diversity. And so especially if you're a POC, if you're Black, um, inspiring to be in tech, your voice is definitely, definitely needed. So just remember, remember that. And I love the fact about, you know, being proactive because, you know, I'm from Detroit and um, I didn't know anything about tech till like my 20s. Like I, that was just not a dialogue that we were having like when I was growing up and now I'm working in tech, but I really think a large part of that was networking, like opening your mouth. And I always tell people closed mouths don't get fed. So if you wanna take anything else from this conversation, just remember closed mouths don't get fed. So you, you can only aspire so much, but you gotta start to do the work. And so I just wanted to p uh, piggyback up what you guys just said there. So to that point, you guys are both black and you're in tech. And while we talk about, all the great rewards and the perks of working in tech and starting your own businesses, there's also the less ideal side, right? Because of 76% majority of this industry being white, what are some of the challenges, the real 
keeping it real. Like what kind of challenges or adversities have you personally faced being black in tech? Cause I think it is important for them to understand that it's not all, it's not a smooth path. Okay. Opportunities are not just gonna fall, very rarely gonna fall in your lap. People are just gonna praise you for being a black aspiring tech entrepreneur or one wanting to work in tech. So I do wanna talk about that as well. What challenges or adversity have you faced being black in tech and how did you overcome them? Like how do you navigate that? Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot. I mean, I think um, I was trying to think about this question last night and like there are two things that, you know, I've not not had challenges like I've had multiple iterations of challenges throughout my career. Um, you know, the the things that were consistent about the challenges were was that I was in a in a place that didn't really honestly have enough of like a humanistic frame to see me as who I was. And I was only like viewed as what I could do for them. So whether that I was like the black girl that you can put on the recruiting magazine or whether I was the only person that you could find that had the skills that you needed to make this, you know, effort work. And whenever I, I was in like those really exploitive kind of places, I was, I was having a hard time, not because, you know, initially people were always really nice initially, but um, I didn't have a lot of psychological safety in those places. Um, you know, you're kind of like swirled and, you know, kind of assumed with like microaggressions and a hostile environment that isn't, that, that just doesn't see you. And that's one of the things that's like a real challenge. I think that, you know, I don't really like to like, you know, amplify or like, you know, focus too much on the stereotype, but tech people don't have to think about the arts, they don't have to think about people, they don't have to think about history, and they don't have to think about psychology and all the things that, you know, that's not part of the training, basically, like, that's not part of what's valued in that system. So it's, it's easy for them to not have to value you, like, you know, you don't have to develop a relationship to be able to, you know, release code. And I think that that's one of the things that for me was really the hardest is that I was in places that you know, they were nice enough initially, but they just didn't really care and value me that much. And like the microaggressions were real. And like that kind of, that had a huge impact on me because then I started thinking, well, am I not supposed to be here? I, I mean, I know, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. That's okay. You know, and it, it, it can start to get to you. And a lot of those times too, when I was in those places, I didn't necessarily have uh, community in the place that I was, you know, working or in school or whatever. So being able to have the community in place where you are, it's hard to be alone by yourself. Like, and, and that's the part I would always um, recommend to people, you know, yes, go do it, but don't go at it by yourself because being isolated can make it 20 times harder than it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah, most, 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 most definitely um, that's true. And I was on another um, talk the other day and, you know, excuse me if the numbers are wrong, but um, somebody told me that I guess there's some crazy number, like $400 billion in um, funding out there from VCs and people investing in the tech space and less than 1% of that goes to people of color. So, wow, you know what I mean? And that's something that, that's a big hill to climb to get some you know, venture capitalist or some angel fund or somebody to believe in you as a person of color and saying, hey, I wanna invest in your company because I believe in you. And I think that's something that we have to keep pushing to change. And um, I've been talking to some people about building a fund where we take it and we go into the inner cities and say, hey, we not only want to help you with capital, we want to help you build, you know, we want to help you with the resources you need to go through the whole process. Because I think part of the problem is, you know, as we all know, we, we can hustle and make something from nothing. But imagine if we had like a little bit of money to do it, it could be golden. And I think what happens too is, you know, when things are actually created, we sell out for small amounts of money. 
because we've never seen those types of money. Somebody, oh, I'll give you a million dollars for that idea. I'll give you this. And you take it and then they turn around and make it a hundred million dollar company or a billion dollar company. So we got to educate as well. And um, I think, you know, those things have to happen. Absolutely. And to that point, um, I think a lot, if, if you guys don't know what imposter syndrome is, it's so it's a real thing. We've all experienced it at some point, point in time in our career, but I think it's most prominent with, with black and brown people. And so I, I just want to touch on that very briefly because um, to your point, Lauren, it's, it's really easy to not feel like you belong um, in a space, especially when it's white and male, but you do belong. And um, with that, with the territory, we do experience imposter syndrome. And I just want to touch on that. If you guys have ever experienced that, do you still experience that? And what kinds of mantras or tips kind of get you through that hurdle of feeling like I don't belong here? Your turn again. <laughs> yeah, I think like the times that I experienced it the most were those times when I was, you know, by myself and I wasn't doing a good job of like, nurturing like my whole self, like Lauren's whole self. And that is like when imposter syndrome really starts to creep in. Cause you're like, okay, not only am I like unhappy or I'm having a hard time, but then like you start thinking, well, dang, it must be something wrong with me. I must've done something wrong or this must've been an accident. And when you're starting to hear all those microaggressions and you're in this hostile environment, it, it does like mess with your mental for real. So I think like one of the most important things that I've done where, you know, it comes up here and there, but I remind myself regular, like, girl, you the bomb. Like, here's all the stuff that you did that nobody else has done, can do, or do it as well as you. So like brag on yourself. Like I have like um, a little notebook where I have like the things that I use to remind myself that one, I'm super smart. I'm really accomplished. Here are the things that I've done. And then also remember, and I think this is something like when you're in tech, you'll start to realize too, half of these jokers don't know what they're doing, like at all. <laughs> so like you, you know, you might not know everything. No one knows everything and that's okay. But remember that everybody else is trying to figure it out too. And not to like listen to, you know, not to listen to like the, um, like the amplification of the story of imposter syndrome, because it, it, it does start to like really get to you. Like, I think that when we talk, you know, we also like sometimes um, unfairly say that like, this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen. And, you know, it, you have to figure out how to deal with it. If you remember who you are, like, and really have that solid sense of self, remember your accomplishments. And then also remember that other people around you are struggling. Like, I didn't realize a lot of times that, you know, I felt like I was having a hard time and I felt like, you know, there's, there's something wrong. I didn't belong here or whatever it was. And there were people looking to me to figure it out because they thought I was doing it really well. So, you know, just remember, you know, remember who you are in the process because, and have people who affirm you around you regularly because it can chip away if you let it. Yeah. And, and I, I could say that too is, be yourself as much as you can. And, you know, the crazy thing about it is sometimes you can't be yourself when you're walking in a corporate office. I can because I come from the rap group NWA and one, no one's going to tell me anything. And two, they expect me to be this rapper dude, right? But when they hear me talk tech with them, then they get surprised, which is unfortunate. I've heard, I've had actually people tell me, wow, you know, I didn't know you were that smart. I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? Like, I'm not supposed to be smart. I'm not supposed to be able to speak with you on what you perceive your level is. Actually, I'm probably smarter than you, but, you know, I'm not going to tell them that. But it's this crazy world we have to live in where you might have to speak a little differently to get the job or this or that, which is unfortunate because of, you know, we are people of color or you come from the inner city or you are a female or whatever. There's so many things that should be thrown out of this world, but they're here and we got to deal with them head on. And even for me, I get through doors because of my background, because of the things, my successes I've had in entertainment, but now because of the successes I've had in technology. But even still though, it's harder for me than some random person who's never accomplished something, you know, to get in. So um, definitely, 
be yourself and, you know, don't be uncomfortable speaking up and saying your piece and saying why you believe you deserve something that maybe somebody is not giving you. Yes. Closed mouths don't get fed once again. <laughs> and, you know, this reminded me um, just of this tiny story really quick. Um, one of our board members name is Omar Johnson. He did like, he used to be the CMO of Beats and he's an advocate and super passionate about this space. And, but he said something that was really powerful. And I, I saw this clip about four years ago and it's always stuck with me. And he was just briefly talking about how when he first started in his career, you know, as a black man, especially in, in, in marketing, you know, and for, for the culture, you know, he was obviously always mostly the black, the only black person in the room. And it really did something to him. In the beginning of his career, when we first started out, when he was entering these rooms feeling like, oh, I don't wanna you know, raise my hand and speak before I'm spoken to because what if I say the wrong thing? What if they don't like the way I talk? What if I answer it wrong? Because they already got this lens on me. And it wasn't until he shifted his perspective because it really starts here, right? It wasn't until he shifted his perspective and said, being black is a superpower. If you think about it, you know, if he's, instead of showing up to these rooms and, and thinking about, being inferior or them not listening to you, go into it saying that this is a superpower. The fact that I'm black is a superpower. I, I can empathize like no one else can empathize. Like my point of view is special and unique. No one else in this room can offer the POV that I can. No one has experienced what I can, my resilience, my grit, my hustle, all of that. And so I just wanted to share that because when he said that, it's like a light bulb went off. And now when I enter rooms, I'm like, being black is a superpower, okay? Like I belong here. That and just I love the fact that you, you use the word affirm, like uh, affirming that we belong here and that our voices are needed. People want to hear what we have to say, but if we don't believe they want to hear what they have to say, they sure aren't, you know? So I just wanted to share um, that story that superpower. Okay, so when we, when we talk about the, the future of tech, because obviously tech is this ever change, it, I mean, changes daily, right? Like Clubhouse blew up in five minutes. <laughs> it went from this no-name app to this billion dollar situation and it's just crazy and that, that just goes to show one idea can really change culture. So when we talk about tech and culture and the overlap between entertainment and music because I, I want to the attendees to understand too just because you aspire to be in tech doesn't necessarily mean Dell, HP, you know, IBM, Apple, Google even. Like there's so much overlap or in between, like culture has a part of it, music has a part of it. So when we talk about the future of tech, what excites you? What are you most excited about um, what's gonna happen with tech and what changes do you expect to see in the future, even in the next year? Um, I'll start there. Um, and it's funny you mentioned culture. So, you know, my new company, GOAT with three Gs, just GOAT. Um, computer company, that's what we strive to be. You know, when we built this company, we were like, what's needed, you know, because of um, what's happening with COVID and no one being able to go out. You're seeing everybody on social media. You're seeing all the DJs who used to travel and tour can't. So now they're all on, you know, Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitch, DJing, and they don't understand it because they never had to do it. So we started our company to help people stream better. And we didn't want to be a technology company. We wanted to be a company that was about the culture. And we want to turn technology into culture. Like you mentioned, every billion dollar company out there is reaching into the culture to help sell their products. But the money doesn't go back the other way. You know, so we want to change that. Like we're hiring from the inner cities. We're teaching kids how to build computers and, you know, how to come up with new concepts and new ideas. And I'm excited about you know the fact that things are becoming more open source things are becoming easier for people to just come up with an idea and build something as opposed to it only being these big companies and i think a lot of the big tech companies are losing their stronghold because if you notice like you said with clubhouse you know apple is a trillion dollar company but yet and still they didn't come up with this and every year you see a new small company pop up with a concept or an idea that no one ever created, no one ever knew about, and they end up being the next billion dollar company. You got TikTok, you got, oh, my buddy runs a company called Triller, which is similar to TikTok. It's, you know, it's going to happen over and over and over and over again. So one of you here or one of us or somebody you know could create the next big conglomerate 
amazing, you know, tech company in the future. But um, I think that that's what I'm excited about. It is it, simply that is the fact that the barrier to create amazing content and amazing things has come way down. It's, my thoughts are exactly the same thing. Like the direction of culture and technology is going to change where, you know, where tech is like extracting from us. Once we have like more capacity in the technical space, we will be able to drive the direction of technology. And TikTok is actually the perfect example because TikTok, they don't care about your content, even though we're using it to share content. They're using tic what you're putting on TikTok to train the algorithm and make a more powerful technology. So like they couldn't care less about what you're putting on there. And I think that once we start to um, develop that capacity, to not just, you know, like there are lots of people who are, you know, able to and understand how to manipulate the algorithm for their benefit, whether it's like you're selling something, if you're a rapper and you're putting content out, like you know how to use the algorithm to get maybe something small out of it, whether it is exposure, whether it is like, you know, those small YouTube checks or whatever it is, or Instagram checks, that's great. But like, how about thinking about thinking about it the other way instead, like you're driving the technology versus the technology, you know, just responding to you. So that's something I think is really going to be important. And then like, you know, artificial intelligence being more rapid, more available for meaningful things. So we have AI to do a lot of things right now. Um, I think it's going to become more available for other things that are simpler that will really actually start to change our lives like yeah we have like personal assistance and stuff like that and we have like these apps in our phone that are running off of ai but like i think we'll have additional resources that are actually more meaningful but there's also like the you know because people are consuming more technology and more tech savvy um the culture is going to demand a higher level of responsibility from technology as well we're not going to be okay you know, now and into the, the further future with technology companies like using our data for whatever they want. So like at Hack the Hood, I have this little phrase like FUBU the data. Like if we, if we control our data, we control our destiny. So how can we, you know, thinking about ways that we can control um, the, the relationship between us and tech companies and, and the capital part of that relationship is important. Oh, and let me say one last thing. If you don't think you can create change, if you, I don't know if you heard about what's going on with the whole GameStop thing. It's about over now, but yeah. a bunch of Reddit users, right? Just decided like, hey, we're going to mess with big freaking investors and like drive up the price of, you know, GameStop, which was, is it going to be a dead thing? Like no one goes to stores anymore to buy stuff. And they drove the price up and literally destroyed Wall Street. And they had to like, literally shut wall street down and stop all there's gonna be a bunch of arrests behind this i bet but you know people can get together and change things absolutely i love it love it love it and we need to get shirts made that say who the data because i'm stealing that <laughs> <laughs> somebody put in the chat where my mind i love it love it um and i love this and i love the fact that we I, I, when we created this event and jonathan and i were talking um it's I love the origin stories. I love the resources, but I, I really want them to have tangible takeaways when they leave this conversation because I'm assuming a lot of them are either working in tech or aspiring to be in tech. But like I said at the beginning of this conversation, it's virtually impossible if you haven't, if you don't, if you don't have a lot of conversations like these or have mentorships or gone to the, the best coding camp or whatever. So if they're in attendance right now and when they get off of this Zoom call, what are some tangible resources, clubs, forums, organizations, maybe your own initiatives that are happening in your company that could support them in their pursuits. Because I wanna make sure that we have action items attached to this conversation if they are out there and they want to know how to get their start in tech or tech entrepreneurship. If you could also say it and then drop it in the chat for them, that would be great. Like just some resources, clubs, initiatives that you know about, anything that would help them in their, in their career or educational pursuits. Yeah, um, well, one that I'm working with here in South LA for anybody who's here in Los Angeles, um, Sola Impact. If you just type in S-O-L-A Impact and look them up, we're actually building a huge tech slash gaming slash entertainment, I would call it hub or center um, in South LA right now. Um, my company, Innovate Next, I-N-O-V, the number eight in N-E-X-T.com. 
um, reach out to me anytime. I'd love to help and, you know, give you guys some more resources. I'm working with the Microsofts and the Googles and a lot of the gaming companies and the, um, to get, you know, more resources to people like you. So reach out to me and I would love to help. And I'll put it in the chat as well. Yeah, I will add um, definitely follow Hack the Hood. Um, this summer, we're looking to open our data science camps. So we're going to start teaching data for the people this summer, um, with, really with the idea that we can use data science knowledge as a key for liberation. And um, so we're, we're that's coming up. Um, I'm going to hope uh, somebody from our team will drop that in the chat. Um, so definitely follow us. Um, I'm a member of National Society of Black Engineers. Definitely follow Nesby. Find out, you know, find if there's a chapter near you. There's always lots of uh, networking events. We've been doing a lot of webinars lately. Um, so there's definitely that available. You don't have to be in college for that. Like just, you know, check out what, what's going on. And then also I will always tell people, um, you know, even if your school doesn't have, um, you know, maybe the right classes or whatever, that you're looking for, try your community colleges because they have courses that can, can be free, if not close to free, um, that can help you get started. So um, definitely reach out to me. I'm on uh, Black Girl STEM Magic on Instagram and Lauren D. Thomas one on Twitter. So you can hit me up directly too. Yep, and my OG Arabian print should be at the bottom of the screen if you see it or don't see it. Um, I'm on, that's my Instagram and my Twitter. And also, too, you mentioned something about community colleges. Yes. So Google has this amazing program. Like they need more cloud. I forget the word. What do they call them? Cloud associates or something like that? Like the cloud is so big that they can't hire enough people fast enough. So they have like, I think it's a $35 course that you can go take at a community college. And literally, if you pass that course, Google will hire you. They don't care. They're like, Come on, we need you. So those kind of resources are out there for people who don't know as well. I mean, this is just the age of information. There's really no excuse of why you can't do your due diligence and find out about these programs. There's so many others where it's money, resources, clubs, organizations, and especially now in light of last year's events, um, a lot of companies are looking to invest in Black talent. So if you're out there, um, you, I mean, Google is your best friend. We live in a, uh, an information age. There's no reason why you can't hop on Google and just spend some time doing the work to look up uh, these, these many resources available to you. Um, and they've just given you a, a ton in the chat. Um, so as we kind of wrap the conversation, um, I do want to, be, you can start sending me questions if you have them. Uh, DM me directly with your questions and I'll ask them for you. Um, I think that'll be the most efficient. But before um, we get into the Q&A, I do want to ask you, just in general, if you have one piece of powerful advice that you could give a uh, Black talent out there, I know it's so hard, it's such a hard question, but if you have one thing that you could just give them to just empower and inspire them to stay the course um, in this industry because their voices are needed, what would it be? Just to inspire and lift them up so they leave on a high note. For me, I would say never, ever, ever let anybody tell you no or your idea is stupid or what you're doing is dumb or what have you. If you believe in it, then push forward and make it happen because so many stupid ideas have made money. And it's not only about money because you know, I, always, I talk about money a lot. For me, money is the more money I have, the more power I have to create change. That's what money means to me, but just don't let anybody tell you no. I would say, you know, remember your purpose. Um, my purpose is to change STEM education so that anyone can choose to be an engineer or technologist or scientist. And if you focus on what your purpose is, then nothing can really stop you. Nothing can stop you except for you. So don't get in your own way, but stay focused on your purpose. Perfect. Okay, so I have a question. If you have questions, send them to me directly, Shari Holly. Um, and I'll ask them for you. Um, so we do have a question that talks about mentorship because we all know this is great because we know mentorship is, is important, especially when you talk about black talent and, and BIPOC talent getting into this space. So they wanna know like, how do you find a mentor? Like if you don't have a mentorship, what are some tips that you can provide to help me find a mentor? Call us, we'll mentor you. <laughs> uh, but, also, <laughs> but also, you know, they're out there. Like, do, you know what? I would say the other place that we didn't even mention, LinkedIn. 
go on LinkedIn. I mean, you'd be surprised who you can get to on LinkedIn these days. You know what I mean? I have people reach out to me with just the most outlandish things. And some of the things I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Okay. Hey, what's going on with you? But I've been able to get to people who I didn't think I could get to on LinkedIn. And I've heard other stories like, did you hear about some person just kept messaging Elon Musk and he finally responded? You know what I mean? So that's another resource as well to look for mentors. Yeah, I definitely did a LinkedIn for sure. You know, us obviously like just reach out. Even if, I, if it's not me, I can tell you, I can send you in the direction of someone who can help you with a specific thing for sure. Um, but LinkedIn, if like, if you use it right, you can get anything. I, um, I tell people I'm a lazy job seeker and that I only do like click <laughs> kind of uh, job, <laughs> job searching, but um, you know, set up your profile and then reach out to people and be like, hi, you know, my name is such and such, and I'm interested in something that you do. I have, you know, ask the question that you want to ask them and then see, you know, see if they'll um, respond. I've, I've had several random mentoring conversations that way from people just hit me up like, hey, I saw, I saw your LinkedIn profile. You look interesting. I'm interested in what you're doing. Can, can we talk? That's like the e one of the easiest ways to network. You'll be surprised how many people I talk to and they're like, oh, I don't have a LinkedIn or I haven't updated it in like six years. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> so if you're one of those people who don't have a LinkedIn, you have homework. And if you have not updated your LinkedIn, you need to be updating it on the regular because you're missing out on so such fruitful networking opportunities from not having a LinkedIn. Um, I have another question that says, can... Yeah, either of you recommend an attorney who's familiar with tech startup or investor agreements? Ooh, I mean, there's a lot out there. Um, I have to look into that. Maybe send me a message and I can see who I know. Depending on the state, I have a recommendation, but they're in Washington state. So I don't know if he's licensed somewhere else, but. Well, they're in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah, just reach out. I'm sure we know people somewhere. <laughs> okay, so reach out. <laughs> I'm actually going to ask um, this next question. It's kind of semi-relevant to the one before that. But, um, you know, because we live in a social media age, that's another thing that I feel like is uh, a lot of talent devalues. Like, can you talk about how we can leverage social media also in our career when we talk about tech and culture? Um, because er almost everyone has a social media in some form, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, but it's not just for personal anymore. I think a lot of people are missing out on uh, professional opportunities with social media. So can we talk about how we can leverage that best to our benefit? Um, okay, I'll start with that one because I've been really, really getting more into social media because I'm old school. Like I'm from back in the day. I'm a tech guy. I'm not really that A-list celebrity. I'm like the C-list celebrity. You know what I mean? I don't want to be out in public much. So you know, I got maybe seven to 10,000 people on my social, but I don't really push it. But now that I've got products and brands and all of this stuff, I got to get more into social media. And there's a few different ways. I often tell people, I tell parents this, I say, if your kid has 10,000 followers and he doesn't do anything, but he's got 10,000 followers, he can go get hired right now at pretty much any company in their advertising or social division because he has that knack to do that you know that's one of the things and two if you're if you're out there and you play video games you do music you do art whatever and you're not on twitch right now just showcasing what you do daily people are making tons of money on social media right now and actually quitting their jobs and only doing that now so i would do a lot of research there's a um hispanic girl um named Angie V, DJ Angie V, she's been around, she's old school. Now for an old school DJ who probably was only making, not, I, I don't know what she was making, just DJing at clubs locally or whatever, maybe being on the radio. Now she's on Twitch, which was a gamer network and DJing and she just celebrated 5,000 subscribers and meaning that people subscribe to your channel they pay you $4.99 a month to subscribe to your channel. And she makes probably 70% of that. So she's making 15 grand a month, probably DJing three days a week and probably more than that because all of the tips and everything else. So there's so many ways to uh, get into social media and make money or make it a business. 
Yeah, I would just say like, you know, figure out your brand. You don't need to do a whole lot, but like figure out your brand and and keep keep it moving. Like um, make sure that you're talking about and posting the things that, you know, that demonstrate your skills, the things that you care about, you know, just as long as you have a message and then just, you know, keep using it, keep, you know, engaging with other people. That's that's definitely my tip um, there. I have like sprout spurts of engagement with my own social media. So, but like, you know, continue to use it, make sure it stays on, on topic for what you're interested in, what you care about. Yes, yes, yes. I love all of this. Um, well, those are it for our question, our Q and A. I want to just, you know, thank Lauren and Arabian. You guys are so great and we need more champions. We need more black people sharing their stories uplifting other BIPOC talent. Yes, I agree, Kristen, this was great. I, I enjoyed it and I moderated it. And so I'm just really happy that you carved out time to just share the wealth and drop the nuggets and really empower our next generation of black talent because we need more black people speaking up. We need more black people on panels. We need more black mentors. And I'm just really, really grateful that I had the, the chance to moderate this conversation today. Yes, Fatima, yes, I love it. See, read the chat. But um, <laughs> in, la in, in short, I wanna just pub pipelines one more time because it is a viable free resource for talent who wanna connect to job and training. So they have training opportunities, structured programs, events like this. Um, career opportunities, entry-level roles on the app. You can download it today for free. It is meant to help BIPOC talent connect directly to tech and entertainment industry. So download that today and follow Hack the Hood. It's a super dope network. They're incredibly connected, incredibly passionate and committed to this space. You would be remiss if you didn't hit them up and find out how you can be involved. So save this chat, number one. Do not leave without saving the chat because there's some good nuggets in this chat. I want to thank all of you for investing in your future and tuning in today. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care.